Come on. We will win. Because we will hit all game. We are motivated. We are dedicated. Come on now. Come on now. We will win. And we are the best on the field. And we hit the field like who? All day like who? All night like who? On the blue like who? On fist like who? Defense like who? This ball like who? House call like who? And it sound like who? And it sound like who? And it sound like who? Welcome to the Short Sports Show. I am your host, Daniel Short. Today is Wednesday, December 7th, 2016. Another jam-packed show for you guys. ton of college football news and the NFL to talk about. Uh, conference championships, recapping those. Uh, Baylor has actually made a smart athletic move. They hired a coach that can actually rebuild a program and clean a house there. Uh, Also, we're going to be talking about, just like we discussed, uh, previewed last week, should the college football playoffs expand? And if so, how many? Six? Eight? Sixteen? Sixty-four? No, uh, of course not. But we're going to be talking about that. Uh, Also, why my reason on why this is the weakest Heisman class in recent years. It's it's bad, people. It's bad. Uh, Also, the best of my cause, my cleats, the NFL's. Uh, finally smart move to not only gain more attraction from other viewers, but a reason to be excited to watch these players and uh, use their foundations or special causes. Uh, we're going to talk about those. Also, have we seen the last of, the, of Seattle Seahawks defensive back Earl Thomas? Might retire. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, we are 300 away. <laughs> uh, no, actually... We're two, 200, aren't we? No, we're, we're 300. We're 300 away subscribers from uh, 1,500 on YouTube. Still want to try to get it before the end of the year, and I'm not placing any limitations. I believe we can still get that. We can still get that. Uh, obviously, having great shows after great shows each and every week and having great listeners as you to keep uh, sharing and liking uh, the show across your social media platforms as well. To get it out there, have your friends and family like the show and subscribe on youtube still want to get it by the end of the year 1500 is the goal we're 300 away i believe we can get it uh what else do we have do 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 do. obviously today is the 75th anniversary or the remembrance of pearl harbor day uh so we'll have uh intergrind we'll have a quick moment of silence and then we'll get on with the show Today's show is sponsored by Intergrind. Based out of Houston, Texas, let former Texas State linebacker Michael Rackpo help you reach your fitness and nutrition goals. With personal training classes that start at $40 a session, why not be a part of this rising program? Now, whether your goals are to lose weight, gain muscle mass, find the right off-season program, or even for you ladies out there to get that booty blast, you can do it all with Intergrind. Not a Houston area, not a problem. Intergrind has a program that is personalized just for you. Intergrind has everything you need to meet your personal and healthy goals. NFL linebackers like Titans Brian Arakpo, Chiefs Derek Johnson, Buccaneers running back Charles Sims, and San Diego Chargers cornerback Craig Mager, along with many other young athletes, have already begun. Find your personalized workout and nutrition plan at intergrind.com and call 832-475-2829. That's intergrind.com, 832-475-2829. 2829 unleash your inner grind Baylor has hired Matt Rule as their new head coach and this is actually a smart move this is a guy who can rebuild this program and whether people want us to continue to live in fantasy land or not Baylor has to rebuild. They have to clean house. They only have one commitment for the 2017 class. That'll likely change. You know, we got the dead period coming up here pretty soon in just a few days. So Matt Rule and his, uh, whenever he gets his staff together, are going to go quickly go out there and start recruiting. He's probably already started recruiting. His first step is obviously trying to get uh, whatever Temple recruits he had and see if they could switch and flip their commitments to Baylor. Now, Despite all the smoke in Waco and all the, the you know, fusion, what, what's going to happen, Rule believes this is the best place for him. Now, it's hard against, uh, to argue against him. You know, with Temple, while you can look at Baylor and Temple and, and kind of see it as a lateral move right now, 
you look at Temple's not joining the ACC or the Big Ten anytime soon. Baylor already a power five program. And if you look at both schools, they're really kind of in the same boat, just one's in a power five conference and one's not, you know, Baylor, yes, has had some recent success, but all of it kind of just goes away knowing how they started six and oh, oh, and six. And it kind of leads into uh, something that they're just going to have trouble. It's it's, they're not automatically going to win eight, 10 games next season, just because rules in there, a good coach, but it, it's going to take a lot a whole new staff and uh, and just what's going to happen with recruiting, what happens with the players now, do they still have the depth, who's leaving towards the NFL. Uh, so a lot of things are going to have to happen. Now, during his time at Temple, Matt Rule was 28-23 and 23 in his last, uh, including his last two years of having 10 win seasons. Uh, his first two years at Temple, 2-10, and 10, and then bumped that up to 6-6, six and six, and then finally the two 10, uh, 10 win seasons. Now, this looks to be somewhat familiar for the Bears. You know, they 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 might I'm not saying they'll, they'll, they'll win just two games next year, you know, but four, five, six might be where they're at next year, and then see where he can build off of that. It's gonna take a few years for Baylor to get back to being a top ten team like we've been seeing the past two, three years. Uh so the next interesting thing to see what happens with Rule. And Baylor is, does he actually keep any of those assistants? And what is his scheme offensively uh, with Baylor? Does he want to keep what Baylor is somewhat perfected with the Art Briles system of that spread offense, up-tempo, going 10, 12 seconds the next play? Or is he going to want to switch it up to do what he did at Temple, where it was still a spread offense, somewhat up-tempo, but... You know, not, of course, as as fast as Baylor when they can run it uh, as fast as they can. So what is he going to do? And with the Baylor uh, assistants, you know, Phil Bennett, the defensive coordinator, I don't know how he still has a job. I think Baylor was just going to let him run it out. Uh, But for a guy that continues to give up 40-plus points against pretty good teams and even some sorry teams, how are you still a defensive coordinator year after year after year? I I mean, he's not like he's in, in, you know, pushed out NFL talent. Uh, it's not like he's uh, had successful defenses over and over again at Baylor. It, there really isn't, ha- hasn't been that much success with them. So I don't see Phil Bennett staying. It's whether Kendall Bryles, baby Bryles stays. And I, I doubt it. The name If Matt rule smart. He, he completely clears house. He has to clear house. Baylor has to wipe out everything uh, from the Bryles and past. It, it's, it's all got to be gone. So it's interesting, but he did not, uh, when he had his first little uh, interview, he didn't rule it out that he would keep some of them. That'll be interesting to see what he does there. Uh, now, even though I'm a TCU fan, I, I don't really like Baylor. I don't like him at all, actually. But I'm glad they actually finally made a smart athletic move that will help student athletes and these football players as they are young men, and some of them just kids, growing into young men, they have someone they could truly look up to and someone who's actually going to teach them good moral values and respect. So good job for Bailey High and Matt Rule. Bears fans, calm down. You're not going to the Cotton Bowl next year. It's going to take some time. You are definitely rebuilding. Definitely rebuilding. Uh, now, after leading Western Kentucky to back-to-back uh, uh, wins in the Conference USA Championship game, their head coach, Jeff Brom, He's moving on to Purdue. He received a six-year, $20 million deal, and he is off to the Big Ten and hopefully you know, going to try to change uh, what they've been struggling. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't blame him leaving, uh, but it's not like it's a great move. Uh, I mean, it's better than Western Kentucky. So I don't see it as a lateral move. It's definitely a bump up. It's just, it's tough to try to go win at Purdue, especially right now with the Big Ten really being the best conference in college football. That is a very hard place to win and recruit. I mean, how are you going to tell people to come to Indianapolis and Purdue and when they could just go, you know, not literally, but they could go across the street and go to play at Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, you know, it, it it's hard to recruit at Purdue, um, but they have a successful coach. Purdue did a good job hiring Jeff Brom. 
Uh, he's been a head coach since 2014, going 30 and 10 and 2 and 0 in bowl games. Um, so it, it should be interesting. Now, the main topic that I've been wanting to discuss and talk about, uh, because obviously it's always talked about for the past three years, it has been talked about. Should the college football playoffs expand next year? All right? It, it, should they expand? I, I'm on. I'm on the side of yes, and only, only to six teams. And I'm going to give you a few reasons. We're going to look back at, at the past three years on why six teams would have just been better, especially this year. Uh, now. I'm not being biased towards any team here, uh, but it, I mean, there is no perfect system. We'll get that. And even with six teams, or if we go to eight teams, some fan base, multiple fan bases are always going to be ex- uh, upset. Whether it's a seventh and eighth seed, or it's a ninth and tenth seed, eleventh seed, someone is going to be upset. There is no perfect system to the playoffs. But I believe six is as close as possible to perfect that we could get. Based on the recent years, based on this year, I-, I believe that we found a system. Now, there is no criteria for making the playoffs. It really isn't. The only criteria, if there is one, is a brand name and what have you done for the past two, three weeks at the end of the season. That's it. It no, no longer matters if you won a conference championship because that's that was the main thing the first year. That's why TCU dropped from three to six the last week, even though they won by 40 plus points in their last game. Now, granted, Ohio State should have been in. Yes, 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 that's fine. I'm not going to debate this anymore. But that was told the last week, oh, yeah, you had to win a conference championship. Then this year, you didn't have to win a conference championship. You didn't. Ohio State's in. Granted, they played pretty well. They had a good schedule. I'm not arguing any of this, but I'm just saying what I am arguing is there is No criteria to make it into the playoffs unless you just have a brand name, undefeated, or how you look the past few few weeks towards the end of the season. That's it. You don't have to win a conference championship. So the Big 12, while creating that Big 12 championship, hoping that could boost them in there, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because had Oklahoma beat Ohio State, and, and they only have one loss to Houston, we have a pretty big debate. And that means Ohio State shouldn't have gotten in. It would have been Oklahoma. Even though Oklahoma's a little bit lower, it would be like, well, they're a conference champion. They beat Ohio State, a pretty good team. Why weren't they in? So I'm just, I'm, I know I'm throwing out hypotheticals and stuff like that, but I'm just saying there is no criteria. So uh, what else have we got here? Do, 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 do. We already talked about last year or the year. The reason for the six teams, we'll jump straight into it. Uh, eight is just too much. I, 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 if you look at the past years, eight is just way too much. And with these players not being paid, which is a completely different discussion, uh, it, it, it kills conference championship games. Whether now, I know we just said it doesn't matter if you win it now, but it takes away any sort of uh, reason to actually get to one or win one because there's eight seeds. And playing extra games, it's too much for college football. I know the FCS, they, they probably play more. Uh, it doesn't matter. For, for FBS, for Division One FBS, it ain't, it's just too much. It's just too much. It kills conference championships. It doesn't make sense. Six, perfect. You keep the conference championship. You keep it where it is important to win it still. And you still have good games. So this is how it would work. One and two seats, they get the bye week. They deserve it. They deserve one and two seats, get the bye week. They're the top two teams in college football. Then you have three versus six. Obviously, three would host the game at their stadium. Not This is not a neutral site. So that's where it gets a little bit fun. Uh, and then four and five, four host the game. They go at it. So it still becomes that four-team playoff that we get that first week. Obviously, this all happens after the conference championship game. And... We would have, and then after that, we would have our final four, and then we would move it to like the bowl games, like what we have right now, or Peach Bowl, Orange Bowl, uh, Rose Bowl, Sugar Bowl, and, and, and Fiesta Bowl. They all rotate yearly, right? So it keeps the same. It's just that first week, one and two gets the bye week, 
three and six go at it, four and five go at it, three and four. They host the, they host the game at their stadium. So I don't care if it's Western Kentucky hosting against uh, Ohio State. It's not about brand. It's about the best teams, even though it, probably the committee will still switch it where it wouldn't be like that. But I'm just saying the third seed and the fourth seed, they would host that game. It wouldn't be at a neutral site. So if you're not sold by that yet, which I'm, I'm kind of shocked that you wouldn't be. I feel like that's pretty solid. So let's talk about past years. Let's talk about why six teams would have worked out the past these three years and how much we take away from the arguing. Again, it's not perfect. Fan bases are still going to be upset, but not as upset as they were with this four. And, I, and granted, four was a great start. We got rid of the BCS system. Great. Four teams is a great start. It's time to change it. So in 2014, the biggest problem was TCU. Dropping from the third seed to the sixth seed, winning by 40 plus points that last week, putting up a great performance. It wasn't like they were just bad and played awful. No. Now, Ohio State, they win the Big Ten. They defeat Wisconsin. They slack of 59 points, right? It's, it's bad. Ohio State deserves to be in. TCU still deserves to be in. So instead of four teams, we have six, and this is what would have happened. These are the original rankings. I didn't change the rankings here. At all. This was the final rankings. Alabama was number one. Oregon was number two. They have bye weeks. Agree? Cool. If you disagree on that, that's you need to look back at that year. Uh, TCU would be the sixth seed since they had dropped. They would travel to Tallahassee to take on number three seed, Florida State. That, that's a solid matchup. That's a really good matchup. I think we can all agree we'd like to see that. Then number five seed, Baylor would travel to Columbus to take on Ohio State, right? That's a pretty good matchup. I think we could all agree we would love those matchups rather than what we got of the Oregon blowout of Florida State in the Rose Bowl and then Alabama being – well, that was still a great game, Ohio State. That was – we probably still would have got that too. Yeah, because Ohio Ohio State would have won and – oh, that would mean Florida State winning. Anyway, anyways, okay. The seventh and eighth seeds were Mississippi State with two losses, or they both were two losses, and Michigan State with ten lo- uh, with two losses as well. I think we can all agree, seven and eight, they didn't deserve. None of those teams decide, uh, should have switched with Baylor and or TCU. Both Baylor and TCU split the Big Twelve. They were both Big Twelve champions. Both only had one loss. Uh, obviously, TCU's loss was to Baylor, and Baylor's loss was to West Virginia, who still in, uh, ended up in, I believe, the top twenty-five that year. Uh, Mississippi State didn't win the SEC. Michigan State didn't win the Big Ten. I think we can all agree here that those top six seeds, Alabama, Oregon, uh, Florida State, Ohio State, Baylor, and TCU were the best six teams and would have made a great playoffs rather than just having four. And it's like, wow, we just uh, kind of screwed two teams. So I don't think I don't think there's really any argument there. And I think we're, we're all excited for a great playoff schedule and a great system. Those are great matchups. TCU at Florida State, Baylor at Ohio State. One of those goes on to take on Alabama in the Sugar Bowl, Oregon in the Rose Bowl. I think we could all agree that would be great. All right, so let's move on. It, there's no real controversial discussion. If, if you think there is, if you really think Mississippi State and or Michigan State deserves to be in more than TCU or Baylor, Oh, I'm sorry. All right, 2015. Now, maybe this is the real year for controversial talks. This is where we really get into it, where maybe eight teams would have been best because we had so many great teams. So, again, it was Clemson number one, uh, Alabama number two. They get the bye weeks. Sixth seed would have been Stanford at Michigan State in East Lansing. Pretty good matchup. They were number three seed. Five was Iowa. They would travel to Norman and take on number four, Oklahoma. Here's the problem. We had the seventh seed, which was Ohio State, and eight seed Notre Dame. Now, I don't think Notre Dame deserved to be in that year. But Ohio State makes a case. Stanford, two losses. Ohio State, one loss. Ohio State's one loss, Michigan State, who was the third seed. Stanford, two losses to no one in the top eight. Ooh, ooh. So I, I think 
maybe the committee would have looked at it and said if they know knowing that there would have been six teams only in, I think they would have switched Ohio State and Stanford. So then we would have had a rematch of Ohio State at at Michigan State and Stanford would have been the seventh seed. Uh, and that would have been very controversial. Who who goes in, who doesn't uh, with that last seed. But that's really it. But still, it's very controversial. Eight teams, then we probably would have been like, okay, we got the best eight because nine and ten, I don't think we're that good uh, anyways or deserved it. So there's that. Finally, this year, Alabama won, Clemson number two. They have bye weeks again. So number six would have been Michigan at Ohio State, a rematch of the game. The game two. That would have been fun to see. Then you have number five, Penn State, traveling to number four, Washington in Seattle. That's a pretty good game. Now, this is where this one kind of becomes a problem. Seven, Oklahoma seed. They're the real talker. They're, they're the Big 12 champion. Uh, and I I believe if the committee knowing, again, if this would have been just six seeds, I think Oklahoma jumps Michigan. I know the ratings and everybody want to see the game two would have been up and, and really worth it. But Oklahoma was a big 12 champion. They're a power five conference champion. Michigan is not. They didn't even make the championship game. Everybody else, Alabama conference champion, Clemson conference champion, Penn State's a conference champion. Washington's a conference champion. Ohio State isn't, but they played pretty well. Deserve to be in. Oklahoma is a Big 12 champion. Both have two losses. Both to Ohio State, and then Oklahoma lost to Houston. Michigan lost, had a, a worse loss to Iowa. Granted, it was by one point. It was on the road, but it was Iowa, not a Houston team. So that would give us an Oklahoma team traveling to Columbus in a rematch of an early season matchup, and I think it would be fine. I think it would still be a good matchup. I, I think we could all be happy with it. Maybe some controversial. But overall, I think we can all then agree we have a great system, a really good system where we have all Power 5 conference champions in it and we have two, good, uh, two of the other best teams in it. Right? We played a good schedule. We dominated their, the, the, the league, the, 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 the conference. Did really good. Had a couple losses, tough losses. But overall, we have the six best teams. Four teams is way too short. It's way it's it's leaving someone who actually can win it all out of it. Eight teams is just too much. It gets it gets a little ridiculous of having too much too many teams. We still get great matchups. There's still gonna be people complaining, but not as much. Not as much. You don't upset that many. It continues to make uh, money, of course, and it doesn't. disqualify or get rid of or hurt the conference championships in any way. And I think we can all be happy with six teams. Let me know in the comment section if you believe the the college football playoffs should expand. And if so, six, eight teams, keep it at four, 16, 64 teams. Maybe we just go an entire season where the it's just playoffs. It's just playoffs. Week one playoff game right there. You lose, you're done. Go to FCS and play somebody. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, tweet me at short sports show. Let me know in the comment section down below. I mean, it, it's – six teams is perfect. I really do. I really do think it, it's just as close to perfect as you could possibly get. It really is. So, Notre Dame quarterback – grad, uh, well, graduate transfer quarterback, Malik Zaire is planning visits to Wisconsin and North Carolina this week. He's expected to visit the Badgers today, Wednesday, and the Tar Heels on Friday. Uh, now – thing with the Tar Heels, though, we got redshirt junior quarterback Mitch Trubisky. He's got another year of eligibility if he wants it. Now, right now, I, I haven't watched enough of him, and we'll have to talk to uh, Matt Yustin, our, our draft expert. Uh, Todd McShay has him as the number one quarterback prospect. Uh, this is going to be the first time that I've paid attention, that I've covered college football, where I didn't even know who the number one college, the number one quarterback prospect was. I could have sworn it was Deshaun Watson still. <laughs> it's Mitch Chubritsky. I've seen him. I've watched him play, but I didn't think he was uh, the number one quarterback for the NFL draft. If it is, damn. Uh, e, that's bad. 
Now, Pittsburgh's also in the running for Malik Zaire, uh, as well as many other teams, but uh, apparently Auburn was rumored in it. Rumors, it, Auburn's always rumored for transfer quarterbacks. They're just like Oregon. Uh, they always try to get just anybody they can because no one can play quarterback for them. Uh, Malik Zaire, he, he wants to stay away from the zone read offense. That's why Auburn's pr- kind of out of it. He wants to just go pro style, which fits him uh, a lot better. Now, he was granted an unconditional release at Notre Dame, so that means he can go anywhere, legitimately anywhere he wants to. doesn't matter if, if Notre Dame plays him in 2017, just like North Carolina does in 2017. So uh, he can just go there and he, he can play against them. Which I like that Notre Dame did that. That was nice of them to say, "Hey, you've given a lot for us. You you, you stayed with us uh, tight this season, and came in when you needed to. You made plays. You try to help us win. We're gonna let you go anywhere you want. That's best suited for you. Even if we play them next year, you can go there. I like that because a lot of teams, especially like Kirby Smart and a lot of the SEC coaches, they're like, no, 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 no. If we play them the next two years, even though you got one year of eligibility, can't go there. Pretty dumb." But that's just how they are. So uh, what else we got? Blake Barnett, he's uh, committed to Arizona State. Uh, He was a former Alabama quarterback. He's leaving. So there's that. Not great news there. Uh, Willie Taggart has been named Oregon's new football coach. He replaces Mark Helfrich, and who was fired by Oregon a week ago after going four and eight and two and seven in the Pac-12 this season. Now Willie Taggart and Mississippi State's Dan Mullen were the were the two finalists for the Oregon job. Uh, a source said uh, Taggart has been at USF for four seasons now, or, and and uh, he was increasing the win total each year, two in his first season to four, and then eight, and then this year he uh, had ten wins, went ten and two, best record in school history. Uh, but he's not completely out of it from the West Coast. Now, he was an assistant at Stanford from 07 to 09. He helped recruit Andrew Luck. And uh, overall, I, he fits what Oregon's style is, and I like it. And I really like this move. I feel bad for South Florida. I kind of wanted him to stay there because South Florida was having some success. I like that program. But Willie Tagger, he kind of brings something that Oregon hasn't had in a while, just some some swagger to him. He's a really good coach, really good person. And maybe Oregon doesn't necessarily rebuild. Maybe they go ahead and just win seven, eight games next season. And then he builds them up from there. I think a lot of recruits are going to look at Willie Tagger and say, and, and, and here, this guy's a really good coach. He, he, he's, he's a win now type of guy. We can go get him. Or we can go play at Oregon. Uh, now, Taggart, he's headed to the West Coast. So now, who replaces at South Florida? Well, you got potential candidates at South Florida would be Alabama offensive coordinator Lane Kiffin. He's going to be everywhere, right? His name's going to be tossed around just about everywhere. Yeah, former Texas head coach, Charlie Strong. He recruited a lot of Florida kids at Louisville. It, it makes perfect sense if he wants to be the head coach there. I uh, got Florida State co-offensive coordinator Lawrence Dossie. He was a former USF assistant. And Ohio State defense coordinator Greg Schiano, who's coach at Tampa Bay, he can go there. So, uh, obviously, I'm rooting for Charlie Strong. Anywhere and everywhere he is up for and, and wants to go, I am for Charlie Strong. And I wouldn't necessarily rule out this move to South Florida. It would be a great spot for him. I kind of want him to go to Cincinnati, but if you have the option, do you want to live in Cincinnati, Ohio, or, you know, South Florida, Tampa Bay area? Probably going to pick South Florida and Tampa Bay, right? I, I think we can all agree that that's probably a better place of living uh, than uh, than going to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. So I wouldn't blame Charlie Strong there. I hope he goes there as well. So we have our last topic in college football, and this is a, a little controversial. Some people are going to like it. Some people aren't, and uh, that's fine. That's fine because it's my show. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this, I believe this year, is the weakest Heisman class we've seen in recent years. It's, it's just, oh, it's bad, people. It's bad. Uh, Louisville quarterback Lamar Jackson, Oklahoma quarterback Baker Mayfield, wide receiver D.D. Westbrook. I'm glad he made it. Michigan linebacker slash safety, hybrid defensive player Jabril Peppers, Clemson quarterback Deshaun Watson, all announced as the five Heisman Trophy finalists for the 2016 uh, year. 
they will be in the ceremony in New York on Saturday night, December 12th. Now, you know, hi, he, let's just start off with this little promo here and this little intro. Uh, after two running backs and a court, one quarterback were invited a year ago, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, it, it's spread out now. We got a receiver in there. We have a defensive player in there. And then we still have three quarterbacks in there, right? And it's likely it's a quarterback that's going to win this award, which would be the fifth time in the past six years. Now, Jackson has been long favored as the Heisman Trophy winner, right? I mean, I made a video back in week eight, nine, ten, somewhere around there. I don't know. You can watch it somewhere uh, that basically said we need to give him the, the, the award, right? Because he was just dominating. Louisville was on a roll and he was just racking up touchdowns. It was right after his seven touchdown game performance, which he's had, what, like three this year? Uh, you know, he's just been dominating. But now the last two games of losses by, by Louisville, just really bad games, you know, they've they've kind of hurt his image, right? He, he, one of those games he actually played really well in. It wasn't the Houston game, it was the other game. He played really well in. But those losses and the late season collapse and how they happen in the fashion they happen, it, it, it hurts the image of Lamar Jackson. And it's kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say just ruined, but it takes away from the great season he's had. It's, 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 it's tough to say that. It's probably bad to say that. But it, it really it views like it has. Now, my biggest problem with him, and my reason for calling this the weakest Heisman in the class, is that there are two players who had dominating performances that des- – that were more deserving of this award than two other players on here. My problem is Texas running back Deontay Foreman and USC cornerback Adore Jackson should have been invited over, wait for it, Jabril Peppers, of course, and Deshaun Watson. Now, whoa, hold up. I know. I'm already going to piss people off with this video. I, I really don't care. Uh, now, my preseason pick was Deshaun Watson win it at all. Because last year I deserve I believe he deserved to win it. I don't D- Derrick Henry, I think we can all agree if there's one thing we g- agree on here is that Derrick Henry didn't deserve to win the Heisman last year. If any running back deserved it last year, it was Christian McC- McCaffrey. It, no problem there. Just because Henry broke a, an SEC record and it's all SEC, Alabama, blah, blah, blah. They get enough fame and, and, and attention. Derrick Henry, good running back. Definitely deserved a running back award. Heisman, best overall player, Christian McCaffrey or Deshaun Watson, much more deserved it, much more than uh, than Henry. That's last year. We're talking about this year. Running backs, Deontay Foreman, over 2,000 yards. Yes, I get what we were just talking about, hurting image by losses by, with Lamar Jackson. So what about Texas? They go 5-7. and seven. He is the only reason Texas had any success on offense. Any success because of Deontay Foreman and what he did. Now, if you want to go by stats, if you're a stats lover, then Deontay Foreman definitely deserved to be in. If And then my biggest problem with this is that we have three quarterbacks, and, if, and obviously only one person can win this, but if there's any quarterback that's going to win it, it's Lamar Jackson just because of all the stats. I don't care if you want to call him just a running quarterback or whatever, passing-wise, everything overall, if a quarterback's going to win this award, it's Lamar Jackson. So why have three quarterbacks? Where's the diversity? Where is recognizing not just quarterbacks? Where's the other players that actually did amazing things and can be labeled as the most valuable player, the best player in college football? Where is that? Where's the diversity here? So I believe Deontay Foreman was the best running back in college football. And I I know my coaches at at San Marcos, they're, they're, uh, they're laughing because Basically, the whole year, I didn't think he deserved it, right? And I, I, most of it was giving them a hard time. Uh, but there was also that San Diego State running back who ended up you know, breaking the NCAA record or is about to with the bowl game. Uh, and I was like, well, maybe him just because of his you know, historical success, blah, blah, blah. Deontay Foreman, just watching him. For stats lovers, he deserves it. For actual people who watch film, Deontay Foreman deserves to be in the ceremony at the very least, if not some serious consideration for winning the Heisman. Look at what he's done this year. Not many running backs have. He is another one. Adore Jackson should have been in. This is clear cut. I know I'm wearing Cali, so it looks biased. I promise you I'm not. 
if there's a defensive player to win the Heisman, it's a Dory Jackson. Not Jabril Peppers. I get it. Jabril Peppers had all the, the, the Heisman hype the past two years. Uh, he's had the most talked about since his high school recruiting. I still remember watching National Signing Day with him uh, and him picking Michigan. I get it. And, and it's not taking anything away from Jabril Peppers. I'm not saying he's a bad player. He's still going to be a top five, top ten NFL draft pick. But if you look at the players who play defense – and if you want to throw some offensive special teams in it, no other player was more deserving of being invited to the ceremony and or serious consideration of winning the Heisman Trophy than a Dory Jackson from USC. Debate me all you want. You're not going to win. It's not because I'm right, you're wrong. No, 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 no. A Dory Jackson deserves it more than Jabril Peppers this season. The stats are right there in front of you. If everything, we're looking at everything here. Because if we were looking just at quarterback uh, and we were saying, okay, the best quarterback by passing yards and uh, passer efficiency. Well, Baker Mayfield wins it. And I don't think a lot of us think Baker Mayfield's actually going to win it. So there's that. Those two players deserved it more to be in that ceremony and potentially have serious consideration of winning it than Deshaun Watson and Jabril Peppers. And I almost switched Watson with Mayfield, but when you look at Mayfield and all he's done, it's kind of hard to leave him out. It, it really is. So there's that. There is that. So what else do we have here? Uh, Westbrook, I'm glad he's on it. Uh, he's my favorite wide receiver. He's been my favorite wide receiver. This guy break, has broken so many uh, records at both Oklahoma and in the nation. Uh, this guy, what did I say, last week had more 40-plus yard touchdowns than eight other entire college football teams in, in the country. He had more, I think it was 11 receiving touchdowns of 40 plus yards. And he had more than eight other college football teams combined or not combined, but total. That's crazy. So DD Westbrook, I'm happy he's in there and he should have serious consideration because if I'm just going to throw it out there. This is my Heisman vote. I don't have one, <laughs> but this is mine. I'm, I'm putting it out there for everybody listening. In order of the top five, number one, my actually, we'll go five up. We'll go five up. Number five, Oklahoma quarterback, Baker Mayfield. Right? I think we can all get fifth place. Fourth place, USC cornerback, Adoree Jackson. Everything he's done, special teams, offense, and defense, making plays, making a difference on the defensive field, Dory Jackson. Number three, Louisville quarterback, Lamar Jackson. Oh, 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 oh now we're all thinking, all right, there's, there's someone new here. Number two, Texas running back, Deontay Foreman, most dominant offensive player uh, running back-wise in the country, helped single-handedly kept an offense going and scoring points in a new offensive system and made plays, continue to break tackles. And if you watch him and you compare him to some of the other great running backs, there's so many similarities, so many. And I think Deontay Foreman is going to be good, a good name for Sundays. Finally, number one, I think you already know who it is now, Oklahoma wide receiver D.D. Westbrook. Most electrifying offensive player in the country. All the stats that he had, everything he made, the difference he made on that offensive field for Oklahoma and, and, and the change of offense that they wouldn't have if they didn't have him. Westbrook is my Heisman winner. Wide receiver, I know. that We haven't said wide receiver Heisman for a while. It's been quarterback, 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 running back, quarterback, quarterback, running back, whatever. Uh, Westbrook is my pick. I know people are going to have disagreements. Fight me, mate. Fight me. I, I don't care. Westbrook is my winner, then Foreman, then Jackson, Lamar, and then Adoree, and then Baker Mayfield. That's my pick. Let me know in the comment section down below who is your Heisman winner. Do you agree that this is kind of the weakest class? <laughs> it really is. Uh, and who's your winner, of course? Tweet me at Short Sports Show and become a fan on Facebook, the Short Sports Show. And subscribe here on beautiful YouTube channel. And we get to 15 other subscribers by the end of the year. I believe it. You believe it, too. I'll see you guys then. So that, that's my pick. I'm going Westbrook. Foreman's right there. And, and to all the San Marcos coaches that are listening, I'm sorry I debated you guys. Uh, <laughs> it was giving you all a hard time. No, I was wrong. 
Foreman is an absolute beast. Uh, and it's sad that only I only became a fan of him the last two weeks of the season, and it's all gone. So nothing but highlights now. Nothing but highlights. Uh, we won't have any projection or uh, uh, predictions this week, uh, as there's only one game, Army Navy. We'll go ahead and pick it, I guess, if you want. I am picking. Army just because of the uniforms. No, Army definitely gets the win over the uniforms. That is incredible uniforms. Navy, those are by far the ugliest uniforms I've ever seen them wear. That was, uh, it was bad. <laughs> those are bad. Navy's uniforms, though, on the other hand, those are really nice. Now, I just got an email from the Texas Alamo Bowl. Uh, I mean, did I get the did I get the credential or what? Because I got invited to the media, the conference, the press conference, coaches press conference. Did I get it? I don't know. I have to call him. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna call him right after this show. I got who, who, who? Brianna and, and Rick. If they're listening to the show. I kind of want to pass. I really do. That'd be a fun game to cover. You'd be helping me out. <laughs> hey, when I when I win some uh, so sports broadcasting awards, guess who I'm gonna say? I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna thank y'all. I'll give me a shot. So, uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, so next week we will have our bowl. Proje- uh, I keep saying projections. Bowl predictions. We're gonna go through all the bowl games. The first bowl game isn't until the the 17th, I believe. So, uh, you know, we'll get we have next week's show to uh, to go over it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and still pick Navy to win this game just because Army has just kind of been bad, uh, and Navy's still still really good even though they have a, a bad loss to uh, in, a, in the conference championship game last week, which is pretty funny that Navy played their conference championship game before their regular season ended. You know, you think about it, every college football team they they have their regular season finish and then a conference championship if they make it. Navy, on the other hand, because of their their game so you know pushed back that. <laughs> their uh they had their conference championship game before their regular season even ended. That's crazy. That's crazy. All right, let's take a quick break here on the Shores Board Show, talk a little intergrind, and then we'll come back and discuss NFL news. Today's show is sponsored by Intergrind. Based out of Houston, Texas, let former Texas State linebacker Michael Rackpo help you reach your fitness and nutrition goals. With personal training classes that start at forty dollars a session, why not be a part of this rising program? Now, whether your goals are to lose weight, gain muscle mass, find the right off-season program, or even for you ladies out there to get that booty blast, you can do it all with Intergrind. Not a Houston area, not a problem. Intergrind has a program that is personalized just for you. Intergrind has everything you need to meet your personal and healthy goals. NFL linebackers like Titans Brian Arakpo, Chiefs Derek Johnson, Buccaneers running back Charles Sims, and San Diego Chargers cornerback Craig Mager, along with many other young athletes, have already begun. Find your personalized workout and nutrition plan at intergrind.com and call 832-475-2829. That's intergrind.com, 832-475-2829. Unleash your inner grind. All righty, we're back with the NFL. Uh, The best of, is this going to stay? It's going to keep falling, right? Uh, the best of the NFL, my cause, my cleats. Now, I absolutely love that the NFL has decided to do this. This is uh, a tremendous uh, marketing thing for them, and this is a great way to actually have players more happy, more involved, uh, and it's it's amazing. And I actually, and this is probably this, you know, getting, you know, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not greedy, uh, un- not satisfied. Of course, the word slips in, but. I would like it if this happened twice a year, right? Let's let's say we have it around week three, right? Right when the NFL is getting going, uh, other sports are still almost coming to an end. Some are in the playoffs, try to get some more ratings, some more views. Have it week three, right? Get the players involved quickly. Then have it again on week 17 when half the league is their season's over. That's the last game, but it allows them to you know express themselves one last time. And for other games that might be lopsided that most people not, might not want to watch, maybe they like a couple players that, hey, I want to see what cleats they're wearing because of the my cause, my cleats thing, right? Have it in week 17. Not bad. Now, bad. now uh, so there was some concern, though, right before we get into the cleats, excuse me, that the Titans and the Browns, since they had their bye week, 
uh, last week that they weren't going to be able to wear the cleats. Now, Devin McCourty uh, and <laughs> Delaney Walker of the Titans, they said they were going to wear theirs anyways. They didn't care if they got fined. They are going to wear theirs anyways this upcoming uh, game against the Broncos. But the NFL on Monday, uh, Senior Vice President of Communications, told ESPN that the league had revised their course and said, uh, quote, we have spoken to both the Titans and the Browns. Players from the two teams uh, had a bye week last week. Can't participate in my cause, my cleats in week 14, end quote. So with that, you know, obviously we can't, we don't know what some of the cleats they're wearing. Some of them have already showed, some haven't. But let's take a look at last week's, the best of my cause, my cleats. Now, these were some of my personal favorites. These weren't just because of their foundation, because I'm not going to rate which foundation was better than the other, because that's completely wrong to do. Uh, but just some of the designs and just some stuff like that. Again, it's just a few. We don't have a whole lot of time, so we're not going to go through, you know, 16 players. It's like six or seven players that we picked. Uh, but there were some really nice cleats, and you can see the rest of them on NFL.com. Go to the best cause, my, uh, or my cause, my cleats section on there, and you can look at all of them to see them up close and personal of, of you know, all the great stuff. So here we go. First up, and again, this is not an order. This is just how they came up and how I started clicking and, and liking. Khalil Mack, Oakland Raiders linebacker. Now, very nice, sleek design with silver and purple it's for the Lupus Foundation of America. I'm not a shoe expert here. I'm not a cleat expert here. Uh, I did work at Nike for like two months, <laughs> but, uh, the, you know, they were nice. These were definitely really nice. I liked them a lot. Well, that was nice. Uh, the camera decided uh, the battery died. Perfect. Professional. Uh, so like I was saying, nice cleats, awesome design by Khalil Mack. I liked them a lot. Uh, next one, M Miami Dolphins wide receiver Jarvis Landry. Now to some, it looks yellow. So it looks like a brighter orange. Uh, it, it could be yellow. Uh, maybe I'm just colorblind. I don't really know. Either way, I like them. Uh, they were for the site. Uh, cystic, uh, cystic, cuts? What? Uh, cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I like these a lot. They're very nice cleats. Um, almost kind of look, depending on the color. I mean, they could look San Diego Chargers colors with the, the, the bright blue. And then uh, the if it is yellow. But I'm pretty sure it was just a brighter orange. Maybe it's just a flash on the camera. I, could be anything uh, post-production. Either way, I like these a lot. Next up, we had Drew Breeze. He used his own foundation, the Breeze Dream Foundation. I like these as well. Guys, I like all of them. Okay, I like all of them. They're, 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 that's why they're on the list. Uh, so they're all good. Then we had Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver Antonio Brown. Details, people. Details. His cause was the Big Brothers Big Sisters Foundation. You can see the Big Brother slash Sister and the Little Brother slash Sister on the cleat. I don't assume gender people. I, I so it's up to you who you think is going to be who's on the cleat. Whether it's a Big Brother and a Big Sister or, or Big, it doesn't matter. Uh, now, Dak Prescott had one. <clears throat> excuse me, had one of the best as well. How can you not like these? Uh, I mean, other than Adidas, you know. Sorry, I, I'm just kidding, Adidas. If you uh, if you guys want to sponsor the show, you know, kind of hook it up. I know y'all are helping out, like uh, Rashad Whitfield, you know, the the foot guy. Uh, I mean, if you want to throw some Adidas gear on here, I mean, I'm 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 good. I'm good. I, I don't think I have any Nike stuff up here, so I like Adidas. You know, it's cool. It's cool with me. Three stripe life. You know, I'm all good with it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, Prescott, he chose the American Cancer Society and had a blue and white cleat with the opposite color spelling mom and uh, having the, the, the ribbon uh, on the O, in the O, excuse me, for the mom. I like these a lot. These were really cool. And I'm not just because Dak Prescott's a great guy. He's this and that, blah, great leader. No, these are really nice cleats. They're really, you know, details, details. Uh, the last two we got here are Seattle Seahawks cornerback, uh, I was going to say Richard, <laughs> Richard Sherman. Uh, love the color scheme. It actually fits his colors, his team's colors, right? It, some of them kind of went all out in different colors. Like, I mean, we just saw uh, Gil Mack had silver and purple, which I think Lupus color was the purple. So maybe that's why. Okay, whatever. Bad guy. Uh, Sherman used his own foundation, the blanket coverage foundation, the RS on the bottom of the cleat. Well, the Seahawks uh, secondary logo on the sides were a nice touch. I like those a lot. And finally, Dallas Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott. He used uh, SC or excuse me, SPCA of Texas. And as an animal person, I love him, right? He's got the paws on there. He's got the bones. Those are nice. It would have been really awkward 
if Michael Vick was playing and he picked the same found day too not too soon, right? Kind of late. Probably bad joke. It's probably too late, right? That joke is not funny anymore. Yeah. Uh, there, there are much more that I liked, but uh, again, we didn't have t- too much time on the show to uh, show all of them. But again, you can go to NFL.com and see all the others, what all the other players wore. Of course, the Browns and the Titans, they play, uh, and you can see what they're wearing. What were some of your favorites? Let me know in the comment section down below. Also, you can tweet me and, and send me a, a picture of them in case you know I'm too lazy to look it up. So show me which ones you liked. Uh, tweet me at short sports show and you know it'd be nice what they could also do is have these uh cleats uh you know on an auction and sell them too and then raise the money they may uh, might already be doing that i don't know uh if they're not that would be a great way to you know make raise some money for the foundations i really like these cleats these were some of my favorites let me know in the comment section what some of yours were as well you know just just something different something nice uh buffalo bills they placed wide receiver percy harvin remember him uh, on the reserve non-football illness list Monday, ending his season. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wasn't he already retired? Or, or you were also thinking, did he just come out of retirement? Well, yes, both. He was retired, and then he came out of retirement to, sign, to re-sign with the Bills last month, but had not practiced since November 23rd because of migraine headaches once again. That thing has followed him ever since college in Florida. He's missed... Uh, the Bills passed two games because of the condition. He only played two games after returning to the Bills on November 1st. He got two passes for six yards, and he also took one carry for 11 yards. It's just, ah, sadly, it's crazy. To see, you know, we think migraines, oh, man, it's just a bad day, bad headache. You know, we don't think too much of it, but it really knocks you out, and it's been knocking, basically it's ruined his career because Percy Harvin was so electric with the Florida Gators, Tim Tebow, and the winning national championship. And then coming with the Vikings, and then hopefully with this, you know, I thought he was going to have the same success with the Seahawks. And migraines have just knocked his career out. Of course, he had other hip and knee injuries, but it's just, it's been bad. The injuries kind of ruined uh, his career. Uh, the New York Jets will go with uh, the next four games with second year pro quarterback Bryce Petty. Now, head coach Todd Bowles, <laughs> he made the announcement immediately after Monday night's 41 to 10 loss that, uh, to the Indianapolis Colts that. They were going to go with Bryce Petty. Now, he also forgot to mention it to that starting quarterback, Ryan Fitzpatrick, that he would no longer be the starting quarterback. He, quote, got mixed up with the other few things. <laughs> I don't know how you miss. Todd Bowles, he was such a good coach. God, he's, he's getting fired this year. Uh, this was probably probably the last straw. I think he still finishes out the year, but this was had to be the last straw. How you forget and... Only reporters and assistant coaches tell Ryan Fitzpatrick, hey, you're no longer the starting quarterback. It's Bryce Petty now. And and Fitzpatrick was completely thrown off guard. Uh, well, maybe not. Maybe he wouldn't have known that it was, he's just been struggling. It was a bit bad. But I, it's just, it's funny. It's it's all, the Jets season has been complete shambles. It's it's crazy. Uh, now, do, 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 what else we have now? So Bryce Petty, he came in and of course he struggled because they were already down 24 to three at halftime when he, when he was put in, uh, he completed 11 of 25, 135 yards, one touchdown and two interceptions. Uh, the jets who are the losers of four straight were officially eliminated from playoff contention with that loss. Now, uh, a scary scene that we saw on Sunday night was Earl Thomas running into his own teammate, uh, camp chancellor. And, Broke his left leg, his tibula, against the Panthers. He's got no chance of return. He's out for the season. And now he's kind of looking whether Thomas is on, if he's just going to have surgery. He's trying not to. He says that in a text message to ESPN's Ed Warner, he says he's not planning on having surgery, but he intends to have the leg immobilized in a cast to allow natural healing if possible. Uh, he also still told Warner that, retiring from the NFL is a possibility. So my question to you is, have we seen the last of Earl Thomas? That's a good possibility. Now, uh, he said in the text message that was allowed to go public, he said, quote, I'm taking it one day at a time. I still feel the same way I did uh, last night at that time, uh, end quote. Now, he made the tweet right after the injury, and when he went into the locker room and found out, he said, quote, this game has been uh, so good to me, no regrets. A lot is running through my mind, including retirement. Thanks for all the prayers, end quote. Now, of course, this is a very emotional time, right? I mean, you just broke your left leg. And, you know, 
he's really hasn't missed a game. He's only missed one game in his entire career, I believe, uh, which was a Week 12 game with the hamstring. He started eight, 118 straight games, including the playoffs. He's a five-time Pro Bowler. And so when this something this serious happens, it's very emotional. And, of course, retirement is going to come through your mind because all the, the health issues, the safety issues we've been talking about for the past several years, of course it comes up. And you're thinking about wanting to walk again. You're wanting to uh, be able to spend time with your kids and actually do activities with your kids like everyone else. So uh, Pete Carroll said, quote, he was going through, uh, he was going through at, it, uh, at the time through uh, emotional part of dealing with the injury that is serious setback. Now, Thomas uh, still sent an- another message to Ed Warner. said, you have to remember the team. My team is still fighting. I don't want to become a distraction. So we're probably not going to hear a whole lot more about Earl Thomas for a while because he's, of course, a very quiet person already, and he's going to keep it under wraps about the surgery as, as much as possible because, again, he doesn't want to be distra- a distraction to, the, to his team. And being an impact player like that, it's very hard not to be. Not saying it's a, you know, a bad thing, but it's just it's very hard not to be. So I, to me, I'm just more on the side. I, I tend to believe that it's more just of a, being a very emotional uh, time period for him right now and going through this, uh, something that's never even uh, happened to him. So I don't think he'll retire. I wouldn't be completely shocked. We've seen a lot of young players, a lot of star young players, retire at a very early age because of injury and, and safety concerns and health issues. So I'm not going to be completely shocked if he does retire. Uh, he's made his money. He's got money. He's got his family taken care of. But I don't think he will retire just yet. I think he, I think he'll still play. I think it's still in him. Tweet me at Short Sports Show if you believe he is uh, calling quits. So uh, we got some good news now over the weekend. Uh, the man, the man who fatally shot an ex NFL player, Joe McKnight, during a road rage dispute, has been arrested and jailed on manslaughter charge. He's in Ronald Gaser. That's his name. He was arrested late Monday, taken into custody, uh, even though he was, like, let off after they first had him arrested. They they let him go, which was stupid, which was crazy. I get you still got to investigate, but it was pretty clear since he stayed there and handed them the gun. He handed the cops the gun and said, I shot him and basically killed him. Gasser shot McKnight three times from inside his car while McKnight stood outside. Uh, no weapon was found on or near McKnight's body, so it wasn't like he was threatening him. And again, when deputies arrived, the sheriff said Gaser handed them his gun and said he shot McKnight. So it's, it's ridiculous. But here's the, here's the problem, and it gets into a much deeper issue here. A decade ago, Gaser was involved in a similar altercation at the same intersection, ladies and gentlemen, the same intersection uh, with the driver. Now, the sheriff said that back in February of 2006, a man observed a truck driving erratically and called a number on the truck, speaking to a man later identified as Gasser. Gasser and the man got in a fight on the phone, and then Gasser followed the man to a service station, confronted him, and hit him several times. Gasser then drove away, and the victim called 911, of course. Now, investigators found Gasser uh, and issued a misdemeanor summons for simple battery. Get this. It was later dismissed. Authorities have said they're still trying to figure out, trying to determine why it was dismissed 10 years later, nearly 11 years later. This is where it gets to the deeper issue, where the system needs to do a better job of seeing signs of people who've already made a, had an issue and had a mistake. And I know some people are say, well, it, you know, some people make a mistake and, uh, you know, you shouldn't judge them. It's not about judging. It's about rehabilitation. It's about making sure everyone is as mentally there as possible because this right now shouldn't be the time to say, oh, he might need some help. There are already signs on this guy, yet the system failed and they waited until something like this happen where someone loses their life for a stupid little thing loses their life and then we're saying oh hey gaser he might have some mental issues it was there 11 nearly 11 years ago 10 years ago it was there it was there now that doesn't mean okay you you got in a fight with someone and he's gonna go kill someone you know 10 years later no but for something as stupid as that 
there's signs that, okay, he's seriously got some anger management issues, some very bad anger management issues. So something that later can uh, set him off. So let's, let's get him some help. Let's get him some help to, to develop better ways to help that, to, to manage the anger. So something like this doesn't happen where we then say he's going to need some help. He's, he's got some mental issues. No, it was there. It, it wasn't just now. It was there. That, that's, my, that's my issue. This is where I have a problem with. It's ridiculous. Uh, let's move over to, over to some, uh, some, I guess, some good news. Uh, the NFL informed Dallas Cowboys that defensive end Randy Gregory will not be allowed to practice Wednesday. Now, his suspension runs through December 18th the date of the Cowboys week 15 game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But the Cowboys hope Gregory would receive a two week roster exemption to practice. He's currently eligible to return to the active roster on December 19th. Now Gregory was initially suspended for the first four games of the season for violating the NFL substance abuse policy in the off season. Then had an additional 10 game penalty when he was announced that on September 29th for another violation. While there were reports of Gregory committing another violation of the policy during the current suspension, sources say the Cowboys have not received any update from the NFL of a longer potential penalty. This guy also has an issue. He's got a problem. We all got problems, but I'm just saying. Uh, Randy Gregory, there were already issues before, right, at, right when he was at Nebraska, and the Cowboys still drafted him when he fell, and he's had nothing but trouble still. He's got an issue, too. We got to help him out, too. It's maybe something a little bit less, but still serious. Uh, finally, our last uh, quick two things. New York Giants defensive end Jason Pierre-Paul had surgery Wednesday morning uh, to repair a sports hernia in his, <clears throat> excuse me, in his injured groin uh, and is likely to be sidelined for the rest of the regular season. Uh, the recovery time is expected to be at least six weeks. Uh, which would ke- keep Pierre Paul sideline until the conference championship round, where he could potentially return. But let's let's not get our hopes up. Uh, here in a couple of weeks, uh, we will have our NFL draft draft expert Matt Justin. You guys remember him from last year, and we actually talked uh, talked to him uh, just a, a few weeks, several weeks ago, uh, midway through the season, and talk about some players to watch, things like that. Actually, it might have been the beginning of the season. It might have been. I don't know. It was, it was, we talked to him sometime this year. Uh, <laughs> we'll have him back on the show to discuss some of the players to watch for in the draft, as well as our second annual NFL mock draft. Now, our first last year, well, actually, I guess it was the beginning of this year, uh, received over 10,000 views. 10,000 views. Very successful. A lot of people liked it. A lot of people like Matt Yustin on the show. So we're going to have him back on. We've made him our NFL draft expert. He, we'll bring him back on. And uh, you guys can follow him at Matt Yustin on Twitter. Uh, so check him out. Uh, he, he does a lot of scouting, a lot of reporting. Uh, he actually works for the CFL's Toronto Argonauts. So that's pretty cool too. But he also, of course, pays attention to the NFL draft. So we'll have him on here in just a couple of weeks to talk about that after probably about right towards the end of the bowl games, after the national championship game, somewhere around there, uh, we'll have him on. So look forward to that. It's going to be fun and exciting to have him back on the show. Uh, let's wrap it up with NFL Week 14 predictions. As we wrap up this show, we got first week uh, tomorrow night. Finally, some good games. God, I honestly did not know the Jets and the and the Colts were playing uh, on Monday night. I completely forgot Monday Night Football was there. Uh, <laughs> that's how bad when scheduling is like that. I had no idea. Did not care. Did not care. Didn't even watch the game at all because uh, obviously I knew it was going to be bad, and it was a bad game. Unless you're a Colts fan, it was a really good game for you. But well, we have the 10-2 Raiders taking on the 9-3 Kansas City Chiefs, 7.25 p.m. Central Time on NBC. Kansas City is a three-point favorite. I am taking the Raiders to win this game. They're just on a roll right now. The Chiefs as well, they're doing their thing, but I'm taking the Raiders here. They uh, might be the best team in the AFC. We'll get to talk about that next week. Uh, Broncos and the Titans. This should be a really good game to see where these two teams are at. Broncos, eight and four. Titans, six and six, trying to make something happen. Tennessee's actually a one point favorite. So that's why it's, it's still going to be a pretty good game. Still picking the Broncos to win this game, but I uh, hope the Titans put up a fight. Uh, then the next game, we have the Seahawks taking on the Packers in Green Bay. It is Russell Wilson's first time back in Green Bay to take on uh, his back in Wisconsin, 
back in Wisconsin. 3.25 p.m. Central Time on Fox. Seattle's a three-point favorite. I'm still taking the Seahawks here to win this game, but uh, it should be a good game. It's his return to the Wisconsin. That's why a lot of people are talking about, well, can, can the Seahawks handle the cold weather in December of, of Green Bay? Well, guess who their starting quarterback played for? He played at Wisconsin. He's used to this. He knows this. Then Sunday night, we have the Dallas Cowboys taking on the Giants. 7.30 p.m. Central Time on NBC. Dallas is a three-point favorite. I'm taking Dallas here. The Giants offense is sputtering right now. They're kind of lost. They don't. Their management is still a, an issue for Eli Manning. Time, time management. He's, I know it's, it's been coaches, but at some point in his career, he's got to take some responsibility and, and, and handle the time management much better. Cowboys will win this game on the road. They're going to look for revenge. Giants were the only team that's beat them this year. Obviously, 11-1. Giants were the first team to beat them. Week one. Been an 11-game winning streak since then. Giants, sorry, not happening. Cowboys winning it. Finally, Monday Night Football, a really good game. The Baltimore Ravens traveling to Foxborough take on the New England Patriots. I'm loving it. 7.30 p.m. Central Time on ESPN. Finally, some good games to watch, people. Seven-point favorite for the Patriots. I am taking the Patriots here. I know. See, the Ravens are so weird. I feel like they're the best, worst team in the NFL. Best defense in the league right now. Second best rushing defense in the league. Offense, it just, I guess it's true. Defense wins championships because there's nothing flashy. There's nothing special about the Ravens offense. Joe Flacco's not elite. They have no running back. They have no star wide receiver. Their old line is, is getting it done, but it's not great. It's just crazy how the Ravens are 7-5. They are the best, worst team in the NFL. I think the Patriots kind of exploit them a little bit. I think the Patriots have their way, and they they, they win 14-plus points, 10-plus points. I just don't get how the Ravens are 7-5 right now. I really don't. They might just be benefiting from a weak uh, division, NFC North. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But it's, maybe they are good. Maybe they are good. I don't know. That's it for today's show. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Share it. Like it. Let's get to 1,500 by the end of the year. We can do it. I believe it. If it's got to be a Christmas miracle, it'll be a Christmas miracle. Thank you guys so much. I will see you guys next week. As always, God first, God bless. I'm out. Peace. Peace.